Content warning. Genetic engineering, slavery, Nazis, cannibalism, and giant brains from beyond Venus. Action, excitement, horror, romance, thrills and chills, swords and sorcery, rockets and ray guns, a dizzying panoply of the strange and impossible from the darkest depths of the human imagination. What mad universe encompasses such tales as these? Join us as we bear witness to the sweeping sprawl of all the history that never was and all the futures that could yet be. It's adventure as you like it on What What Mad Universe. are the stars, and man is of no account to them, but man is a fair spirit, whom a star conceived, and a star kills. He is greater than those bright, blind companies, for though in them there is incalculable potentiality, in him there is achievement, small but actual. Too soon, seemingly, he comes to his end, but when he is done he will not be nothing, not as though he had never been, for he is eternally a beauty in the eternal form of things. Man was winged hopefully. He had in him to go further than his short flight, now ending. He had proposed even that he should become the flower of all things, and that he should learn to be the all-knowing, the all-admiring. Instead, he is to be destroyed. He is only a fledgling, caught in a bush fire. He is very small, very simple, very little capable of insight. His knowledge of the great orb of things is but a fledgling's knowledge. His admiration is a nestling's admiration for the things kindly to his own small nature. He delights only in food, and the food announcing call. The music of the spheres passes over him, through him, and is not heard. Yet it has used him, and now it uses his destruction. Great and terrible and very beautiful is the whole, and for man the best is that the whole should use him. Man himself, at the very least, is music, a brave theme that makes music also of its vast accompaniment, its matrix of storms and stars. Man himself, in his degree, is eternally a beauty, in the eternal form of things. It is very good to have been man, and so we may go forward together with laughter in our hearts, and peace, thankful for the past and for our own courage, for we shall make, after all, a fair conclusion to this brief music that is man. Last and First Men by Olaf Stapledon. Hi, welcome to What Mad Universe. I'm Adam Prosser, with me is Philip Rice. Hello. Hello. Uh, today we're looking at uh, a book that is actually uh, has a bit of an odd place uh, in science fiction in that it's very influ it's another one of these books that's pretty influential but got forgotten pretty quickly. Um, there are people who know of it and it's it remembered in a lot of circles. Uh, but and in fact, Olaf Stapledon was called was called the most important British science fiction writer between H.G. Wells and Arthur C. Clarke. Um, and I see it, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, most people don't know the name. He's not, he is not Norwegian or Swedish. He's a British, uh, he was a British writer who got the name because his parents were reading lives of the Norwegian Kings when, when he was <laughs> born, apparently. Um, and it was, uh, William Olaf Stapleton. That that's right. It's William Olaf and Stapleton. Yes. Um, Staple Dunn. I, I'm going to have to remember that because I keep saying time. Yeah. William Olaf Stapleton. Uh, he was a philosopher. He was a PhD. Um, and he served, he was, yeah, he was a philosopher and a nonfiction writer before he got into science fiction. And, uh, what he's done here, we'll talk about him more in a second, but, um, he's written this very epic, uh, book. It was written in 1930, uh, that spans 2 billion years of future history and, uh, the coming and going of multiple different, uh, versions of the human race, multiple different, I guess, species of the human race. Since millions of years pass, there's time to evolve into different forms, basically. Um, and uh, I had read this a while ago. Um, Philip just read this for this now, but he'd heard of Olaf Stapledon through another one of his books, right? Uh, yeah. Um, 
uh, I mentioned in the Nyctalope episode, the uh, um, uh, comic book series, the uh, Chimera Brigade, um, a French um, sort of League of Extraordinary Gentlemen type thing. Um, in this case, uh, they used uh, Odd John, or the character John Wainwright. Now, this comes from uh, Stapleton's book, uh, Odd John, which was, uh, uh, the title is Odd John, A Story Between Jest and Ernest, which was uh, published in uh, 1935. It is about a Superman, but not like a superhero type character. Um, right. John Wainwright is a um, um, homo superior, and this is the first uh, use of the word, of the phrase homo superior. Uh, predates X-Men and, of course, the David Bowie song, Oh You Pretty Things. Um, yeah, uh, John Wainwright is like a... a uh, he has a large head, like a very large head, giant eyes. Um, the the book's about uh, a race of uh, mutants um, who are super intelligent and extremely, um, well, superior to humans in every way, and they eventually develop psychic powers and um, uh, form a colony in, um, on a... Uh, uh, on a secluded island that uh, eventually gets wiped out by uh, the uh, existing powers who are terrified of them. Um, huh. Does Odd and, John uh, die? The, does, does he survive? Uh, he dies. Hmm. Um, they, they all sort of die together voluntarily um, because they can't, uh, they've sort of joined together in a way and can't live apart anymore. Um, uh it's sort of a, he's sort of like a weird, creepy child for most of it. Like, um, he's sort of amoral, not immoral, but like above right. human morality, sort of a Nietzschean thing, I suppose. But like, he's explicitly a different species than the rest of humanity. And he doesn't really consider. Yeah, that, that, I was just going to say, that seems to be a, that seems to be a recurring theme for Stephen. Yeah. Uh, because that's what happens in this book as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, uh, it's similar in a lot of ways, though this is more of a character study than a... Um, right. Uh, like, there aren't really yeah. any characters in Last and First Men. Right. I mean, there's, not, there's not, characters, well, but sort they're... Of. Yeah, they're... It's, they're not so named, it's, they're not like... It's written like a history. It's not written yeah. like, uh, you know, here's a character and here's his arc. It's like, if someone yeah. shows up, it's because they're incredibly important and they're sort of described in the third person and in mm -hmm. like a paragraph before, you know, we jump yeah. forward another million years kind of thing. There is the literal last man to ever live uh, <laughs> at the end of the book. That, so that's the thing. These, um, you know, he's, he's writing in the thirties and he's, he's really got a wild imagination. It's not, um, I mean, even HG Wells had some similar stuff like the time, uh, the time machine, uh, leaps forward pretty far into the future and there's some weird stuff in that book but this is really really weird as you would expect you know millions of years of humans evol have a human evolution to be um but um yeah he basically what happens and i mean what happens quote uh is that you know we pass through multiple different men and they're all numbered so we're the first men and then there's, uh, you know, the second, third, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the 18th men are the last men who are contacting us by going back in time and basically telling mentally, us. Mentally, yeah. Yeah, ment telepathically because they've... Oh, that's they've, another thing that happens in Odd John. They can uh, telepathically go back in time. So right. visit other people. So that very much a recurring theme. Yeah, fact, well, he's, could, he's interested. You could say they might exist in the same universe. I mean, they don't necessarily, but uh, you hmm. could definitely slot them in together. Well, he's the, so this is the thing that Stapleton seemed to be really interested in, which was um, uh, the idea of collective humanity and not exactly anti individualism, but uh, the idea that you know you would think of yourself as a, as a collective species rather than an, than an individual, and you'd be looking out for us together. And like you know, he was very very devoted, both in real life and in the book, to. Um, anti-nationalism and like you know bringing together humanity under one aegis he didn't want there to be separate countries he wanted there to be one world uh government and one uh you know one one species all working together which happens a few times in the course of this story uh but in bad ways they don't it doesn't 
really work properly. <laughs> and he's he's very interested in the idea of like uh, the spirit of, in some cases, a nation, uh, or then the spirit of you know a race together, collective. Um, and yeah, he seems to see telepathy as kind of this higher thing that we could achieve, and that would be a symbol of like being really advanced that we were all thinking together as one. Mm -hmm. um, he does yeah, the group mind is a is a recurring thing in both of, both these books, right? And I believe as well in Star Maker is the other book he wrote, uh, which I haven't read, but it, it it goes away from this one. This in this one, uh, mankind is confined to the solar system the entire time. Uh, they never go out into outer space until the very end. They start sort of desperately saying, maybe we'll send out stuff into space uh, so the human race will live on. But in uh, in Star Maker, it's about traveling through outer space and going out into space, all the different forms that could take. Uh, apparently in Star, Star Maker, he, he uh, posited the idea of a Dyson sphere for the first time. Um, and yeah, I was about to say, um, the, uh, the guy who... Um... Dyson said it should be called a uh, Stapledon spear. Yeah, he said he got it out of Olaf Stapledon, uh, which is, if you don't know, that's the idea of a, uh, a a star that is possibly entirely contained, but not necessarily totally entirely contained, by a vast um, metal or some kind of solid uh, ring, which could then harness all the energy of the sphere, of the star and provide a you know a place for people to to walk around on an inhabitable uh, space. Um, practically speaking, I don't think you could build something that big, but <laughs> um, but just the idea that rather than planets, you would use like a surface that would that would be tilted at perpendicular angles to the star and, and absorb a lot more of its energy and be able to use a lot more of its energy than, than we use on a planet. Yeah, this um, uh, Last and First Man is also an early... Uh... Uh, I'm not sure if it's the first, but the, the use of genetic engineering. Yeah, I don't no, I don't think it would have been the first because I mean, uh, Island of Doctor Moreau precedes it by quite a while. Yeah, and but it, that's that's not genetic engineering though. That's uh, that's operations. Uh, that's true. That's true. Um, well, R U R also uh, precedes it, and that's essentially genetic engineering. But you're yeah, right. I guess. But they 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 sort of weave them like yeah, it's it's with part machines of a, and things. Yeah, it's part of a process. Um, well, they do talk about how you know the chem. They you know they they framed it in terms of chemistry in RUR. How it was you mm -hmm. know you're using uh, the chemical processes of biology to create this new man and to create a substance. And but yeah, you're right. It, it is closer to what we would recognize as genetic engineering in this story as opposed to RUR, where it's more chemical. Yeah, so you, you, like I said, not necessarily the first, but definitely a very early and right. probably influential take on it in science fiction. Yeah, you can see the evolution coming from those different takes. <laughs> you know, with, with Moreau, it was surgery, which is a little bit over the top now to, to imagine you could do it with surgery. But yeah, it's, it's that whole basic idea of, okay, what if you could reshape <laughs> genetics and biology? Um, but yeah, he's he. Um, but but let's uh, so let's uh, recap some of this stuff. He he spends quite a lot of time on the us, the first men, and he sort of it becomes exponentially faster because he spends quite a lot of time describing what's going to happen in the next uh, few hundred years. Um, and as with uh, Angel of the Revolution in the show we did, Terror in the Skies, um, he kind of gets it completely wrong while also being right about a lot of things like he, he you know what i mean he's he's got a lot of insight mm -hmm. into where things would be going but he gets so many of the details completely wrong right yeah like he he uh, again this is before world war ii and he talks about um he, he doesn't foresee hitler obviously because this is right before hitler um so you know he must have hitler would have existed but he would have been some kind of fringy figure at this time and uh, but he does talk about Mussolini, although not, not by name, and talking about how Italy was probably going to start a war uh, under under Mussolini, who he describes as he basically says there's, there's some meathead who's going to rabble rouse in in Italy. Uh, he talks about uh, you know then Russia and Germany uh, conflicting with each other. He describes communism in Russia as it's going to get hijacked by capitalism. Which did happen, <laughs> not directly, but not not yeah. the way he describes it. Um, but it also describes Russia as the Soviet Union working closely with the U.S. and forming a uh, 
a huge bond between the two countries. Yeah. Which I mean, obviously did not happen. <laughs> well, except it kind of eventually in, in the did. War, but... <laughs> yeah, well, in the war, but it also, like, nowadays, Russia and the U.S. work together. And he... Yeah, but it's not the Soviet Union. Right. Well, he de- the way he describes... But he describes the Soviet Union as having basically petered out from its initial promise into something that, you know, was basically hostage to capitalism. And that's kind of where Russia is now. It got yeah. there through a completely different chain of events, but, you know, effectively... Uh, that's what happened. And and he talks about uh, Europe getting wiped out through wars. Again, he kind of anticipating World War II, but then Europe is completely off the map and America and China become the world powers. Um, Which uh, has happened eventually. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's <laughs> again, it didn't get there the same way, but effectively that's, that's how it turned yeah, out. Yeah. Uh, this, this has a war between uh, England and France that ends up wiping out Europe yeah. as a power. Yeah, he's he's got a series of, you know, it's it in some ways it's you know negative book like a depressing book. It's a series of, you know, uh, apocalypses and and species and you know not reaching their potential and then dying out. But it's always sort of a fluke. Like it's never quite. Oh yeah, their own natural uh, failures caught up with them. It was always like, <laughs> in the early going, he talks about England and France. Uh, oh, they would have. Uh, you know, the British character is thoughtful and the Germ- the French character is uh, thoughtful and so on. And when they t- when they wiped each other out, the German character, which was more romantic and less intellectual, took over and blah, blah, blah. And then the American character, <laughs> he's got some sick burns on the U.S. character in this. Yeah, he, um, he obviously had some issues with the United States at the time. Um, yeah, he kind of likes them, but he also has some really harsh criticism of them, basically. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, about uh, Hitler. Uh, Hitler is alluded to in Odd John as well. Um, takes place in um, uh, the the final bit of the book takes place in 1933, but uh, most of it's about John's childhood. And uh, at one point, he goes uh, to Germany and he talks about how um, you know it, uh, it seems fine, but there's a there's a darkness brewing underneath. And he was talking about because uh, uh, he's you know. Uh, wonder wonderkind and can peer into how uh how things function even before he becomes psychic and he's right. he's sort and of he would have... nationalism being uh, right. becoming a popular thing that uh people are yearning for for something to latch on to as and scapegoat and so forth yeah it was it, it, it's it's uh that like then at that point he you know he would have been aware of and horrified by uh, the Nazis, I think, and and that yeah, yeah, this was uh, that was written in thirty five, so yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, he was a um, he was a pacifist in World War One, but he uh, mm-hmm. abandoned that in World War Two and supported the war. So, well, he was always a pacifist. I think I think he just decided that World War Two was you know like a lot of people at that time, uh, there was a real movement for genuine pacifism and uh, anti nationalism, but you know, World War II came along and people kind of went, well, <laughs> we've got to stop these Nazis. We'll make an you know? exception, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, he went right back to uh, pacifism and stuff after the World War II. Um, he was actually, uh, you know, as as we've commented here, he was apparently a very getting active in the anti-apartheid movement. And um, he, he he participated in, uh, I'm, I don't have the name of it here, but a big anti- international uh, gathering that was supposed to be, you know, again, cosmopolitan, anti-nationalist, and uh, was seen by the FBI as a communist, uh, communist propaganda. <laughs> yeah, he apparently, uh, he was often accused of communism, and he seemed sympathetic to it, but he never mm-hmm. accepted the label. Right. Um, in uh, Odd John, also, they, uh, when, they're, um, when they form the, the island uh, towards the end of the, the book, Right. And they're visited by by uh, representatives from the Soviet Union, and yeah. uh, the uh, the Homo Superior uh, kids say, um, um, "We are communists, but that's just the starting point. That's right. that's not you know, mm-hmm. um, that's just where we're starting right. from. We work together and all that, but we have other goals, yeah. and uh, we're well, they're it's not, funny because not really compatible with with what you're doing." Yeah, I mean that's that's funny because that's probably what communists would have said at a certain point in history that no that's just going to be the first step and we're going to keep moving yeah yeah but yeah no he he like 
I, I feel like he maybe just didn't want to tie himself down, but I think in in label it, and he wasn't for all that he wrote about these political upheavals. I don't think he was interested in the technicalities of politics because uh, mm. he writes a lot about oh the national character of this nation was that they were stuck with this thinking and this thinking like he literally describes basically with America and China being the the, the surviving major nations. And he talks about how the American character is, uh, again, he's not wrong, uh, like action and dynamism and doing stuff and not really thinking about it. He doesn't say that, yeah. but, but well, just sort of no, they, 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 they explicitly worship action right. at that point in history. Like they, the, right. um, uh, their God is like the uh, energy as, as in um, mm -hmm. doing things. Right. And, and it's kind of religion and science. You're seeing them mashing together in a way that, didn't exactly happen, but there's some some truth to it of just like using yeah, religion as a means to an end, and also puritanical at the same time. Right, using religion as a means to an end, whereas China became much more sort of, in his view, kind of loose and, and sensualist, but also you know think you know let's think everything through a million times before we do anything. And when they combined in a way that could have been more productive in his mind, uh, they actually combined in a way where. Uh, they got the cult of action, but in a way that didn't cause them to think. Like, it kind of got the worst of both worlds, is how he describes it. Um, and that's what eventually led... And, and this is the other thing that he predicted, because it ends with resource depletion. That's what brings down the first uh, you know, world government of the first men, is that they run out of coal, <laughs> which is what everything's powered on. Um, yeah, there, there's also a bit where... Um sort of the closest thing it comes to characters really um like having dialogue and stuff is a uh, an american representative and a chinese representative uh, meeting to discuss some um, uh peace and a, a, an eventual world government combining the two nations and uh they're um met with a um they run into a woman who's like um um has a background in a number of races and um, they're both sort of, uh, fall in love with her and, um, she ends up being the, the source of some contention yeah, she, in the, in the it, future world government. There's a weird little, yeah, like one act play in the middle there. That's like allegorical about how, you know, the, it, like it's literally America and China. And then this woman comes along and she's supposed to be like a mix of all the races and it's who's and she's representing the world and the future of mankind. And it's like America walks off with her, and instead of China, and because of that, America dominates the proceedings, and that's what kind of leads to <laughs> a stasis that is eventually uh, that eventually brings everything down. He, he there's sort also of, an interesting thing with the uh, the Chinese representative holds that in his pocket and tries to um, out the the American, the now leader of the world. Um, with the information that he, he was unfaithful to his wife, but the American spins it as, mm -hmm. um, yes, my own, I, I violated my own personal morality, but I did it because she represented the world. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, it was like a, a higher <laughs> purpose sort of thing. And, um, that's a great um, excuse. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, uh, if anything, I was, I was damaging myself by, by harming my own morals. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And then that apparently becomes a, a standard practice in, in the um, the religious yeah. of religiousness of the future, where you have your wife and you also have your girlfriend, right? And it's to you know to show your well, it's to be like the president, basically the pr the <laughs> world president. Yeah. Anyway, so but yeah, so that that world that they forge it, it ends up uh, being kind of mindlessly. Uh, engineering and like it, it becomes it worships flight everyone flies everywhere and it's literally part of their religion and then they run out of yeah. fuel for the, the planes well, and, and they, they they're running out of fuel and but they refuse to stop flying right because yeah that because if they did it would be insulting to uh to yeah. god so god, god help us um, their god god help us right? god help us um, um uh, which comes from um there was a um in the i believe way back in the war between England and France. Yeah, the British uh, guy goes, God help us. And yeah, they're already... developing uh, nuclear weapons, and um, they just use it once and then um, yeah. erase knowledge, or erase all the research they did so it can never be used again. Right. Which, uh, I wish that happened, but... 
Yeah. Well, they, yeah, that's, they, they make a decision, which also, that's another thing where it's like, if they hadn't done that, things might have, things might have gone better. There's a series of flukes. But anyway, so let's, yeah. let's jump ahead to the more, to the fu- even further future. So basically there's a, like that, the, everything collapses as a dark age. Um, I have to say, I, I read this for the first time a while ago and I skimmed it. So some of the precise details, um, what is it that happens that there's some gigantic worldwide volcanic eruption that, that brings everything down? How do they get there? No, oh, um, I think it was they were trying to redevelop the nuclear technology and it went off. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's a lot of stuff happens in this, so it's kind of hard to keep track <laughs> of what happens where. But I think that was it. Yeah, there's a dark age. Um, uh, they they and... start, uh, they start worshiping science as like a, um, a, a godly thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, they don't, and this is similar to something that happens in, um, in foundation where, uh, right. at least for one of the, the sections where, uh, science mm-hmm. becomes a religion, but the, the scientists don't actually know how anything works because they don't share their discipline right. between each other. So they all sort of, it's all sort of mysticized. Um, yeah. and the foundation it's, it's, it's being manipulated by the foundation who actually understands the science and they're saying, you know, it becomes like a cargo cult that they use to manipulate the politics, which is what they're trying to do. Yeah. And in this uh, case, similar except for the manipulation, it's just a cargo cult. Just right. It's old. them going, oh, if we could only get our science back. And again, it's sort of this danger, like that, that whole section of the book is kind of, you know, talking about the danger of science without understanding, without some like higher purpose, higher, higher attempt to grapple with the real meaning of the world, uh, which was something Stapleton seemed to really care about. He wasn't, he wasn't really fond of religion, but he did like the idea of just sort of your, he didn't like organized religion at all. It was clear, but, um, uh, he did like, uh, the spiritual, Yeah, I guess he would be a poster child for, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Right, exactly. And the, he was agnostic, apparently, though, so he didn't necessarily right. believe in in a god, but like some sort of. Right. He thought the the emotions were important to uh, right. to hold on to. Yeah. So there's yeah, also a bit in Odd John where he visits a church and he said it's mostly wrong, but there's there's a kernel there. <laughs> yeah. So that's that seems to sum up what Stapleton thought uh, about religion. Like he he admired that it was grasping at something higher, and that was. That was something he 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 uh, he looked at a lot. Anyway, so the first men uh, basically there's a worldwide catastrophe caused by tinkering in the ancient science without really understanding it. Um, most of the men get wiped out. There's a science expedition that survives at, at like the pole, uh, which repopulates the human race. They evolve into the second men, who oh, are uh, first. There's the Patagonian uh, thing. Yeah. Well, that's. I think the Patagonian comes before the uh, the giant world explosion, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. Yeah, there's different sort of things with the first men. Um, but the, yeah, let's just go to the second men, which is, uh, they're the big-brained ones. And they're sort of, he, he suggests that, you know, first men, i.e. us, we're too immature. We have weird... Uh, nervous systems that aren't ready for like higher thought into the level that <laughs> we're at like we're we're jumping ahead of ourselves too much basically and that's what causes all the, the all the the commotion where the sec whereas the second men um are actually have a certain stability and and ability for introspection which we didn't have they're i believe bigger than us right and yeah they're taller uh and they have larger heads and they uh um, right um uh, they can see more colors and all mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah, they, um, and, and in fact, their heads are so big that there's a point where it seemed like they're they're not going to be able to survive because they're they're evolving heads too big for the rest of their bodies, basically. Uh, but they get around it somehow. I can't really quite remember. They find some medical way of getting around it. Uh, I can't remember. Sorry, yeah. it's well, that, it's a that, fairly long book, and a lot of stuff happens. <laughs> yeah, well, that was they made a big thing about that because apparently there's one period where they wrote all these poems that were kind of fatalistic, and and there's this great culture and art comes from part of the second man because they know they're doomed, basically, mm-hmm. uh, even though they weren't, as it turns out. But that sort of inspires. Well, that later also ages. came from the the Martian invasion. Right. Which well, we then the okay. So the Martian invasion is what kills the second man, and he talks about how sort of the second men were like on the verge of maybe transcending everything and and becoming 
what 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 Stapleton thought mankind could become because they're really uh, they're really superior to us. Uh, but then there's a Martian invasion uh, of energy beings from Mars. Well, they're what? they're not energy. They're they're um, uh, bacterial, uh, microscopic beings that uh, set, communicate via radio waves. So they have um, group minds, which is another thing. But um, they um, uh, there's individual swarms, but they also come together in a single group mind often, which it said is inferior to the individuals. Right. Because it doesn't have the same um, uh, perspective. The group mind is inferior to the individuals, yeah. And and uh, by doing that, they basically, the two planets are essentially, <laughs> they kind of wipe each other out. Um, like yeah, this. Um, the, uh, the Martians uh, often set up on Earth, and uh, uh, the Earth Martians, would s- because they're separated from the ones on Mars, would form their own identities, and then the, the Martians would... Or the Mars Martians would come and wipe those Martians out. So there was w- war between Martians as well. Right. And uh, eventually, um, because everything's so, uh, after like millions of years of this, uh, just constant invasions and their people being destroyed, the second men uh, develop a um, biological weapon that will wipe out both the Martians and themselves. Uh, and they, they do it without hesitation because they're so... Uh, mentally degraded by that point they just want to they just want it over with <laughs> and uh yeah so yeah it's it's they're kind of brought down by again a fluke kind of a weird quirk of history um yeah and then and then the uh, so then the third men evolve and the third men are almost like <laughs> they're cat girls basically the third men um they're they're described as even being looking a bit like cats with crazy big ears and they, uh, they're sort of... Uh, they're the music ones, right? They're... Yeah, they love music. Uh, they love art. They're more... They're, and they're really into biology. And they, they keep pets. So they're kind of this... They've got this sort of weird, uh, quirky, trickstery perspective on things. Rather than being, you know, solemn and serious, there are certain brands of science they like to play around with when they, when they get to the level of being scientifically advanced, which, of course, takes, you know, millions of years, as it does with all the other men. Um... And uh, they get to the point where they're uh, they want to just sort of toy with genetics, and um, when they do that, they start to build like a giant brain, essentially, um, which uh, literally takes up an entire room in a house. While well, they they make, of course, thousands of years of experiments, but eventually they build. And a- also, uh, there's all this equipment to support it. So. Right. Yeah. It's um. yeah. It's got like a, a room full of breathing pumps and stuff. They just made a brain as big as they could. In a in a body, a human body for them, um, and yeah, it's 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 essentially, and it's like they literally build compartments for all the compartments of the brain to fit in, um, but it and it has like eyes on stalks that it can retract. Um, it's it's essentially a gigantic organic computer in most ways, um, and uh, it's unfortunately uh, because they and they're so pleased with this creation. Uh, which they've made as effectively immortal as well, uh, and it's so such a great brain that it you know it can tell them how to organize their society, and they basically end up sub- becoming subservient to the brain, uh, and the brain, which is the fourth men, um, builds more of itself, and the brain basically they're conquered by giant brains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they um they eventually uh, create a, a race of uh, based on the third men, but without. Uh, uh, individual um, without the ability to say no, basically, so they're a slave race. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they, they turn around and you know turn on their creators and and like, genetically engineer them down to being their just their hands and eyes and hands to do all the and the brains and are they very also wipe out all most other animals on Earth as well. Right. Yeah, they're very they're very cold and cruel, and they don't have any. You know, it's the classic thing of giant brain having no compassion and no yeah, emotion. But it just wants to... It's sort of interesting because they become... Uh, they're, they're so obsessed with learning things, but they eventually realize they're they're not content with... Because they've reached the point where they can't really... Yeah, they, they... Yeah, they understand they're missing something, basically. Yeah. Like, they're smart enough to realize that, oh, shoot, all that emotion crap that we thought was so useless that we got rid of... Uh, but we're limited by it. And I, 
I think the implication is that there's sort of, again, there's that not necessarily spiritual, but like philosophical longing for higher purposes, basically. They genetically engineer the fifth man uh, right. to be like a perfect, perfected version of humanity. Which I like. I, I like that because it's these evil brains doing this to go like, okay, well, how can we experience, you know, these this great intellect while, you know... How we, we need to experience all these different uh, ideas. We need to, again, to go back to walking around and having arms and legs and heads uh, because that, you know, creates this context in which the brain can strive in the way that we're, we want it to. And we're going to do this to be, you know, evil intellects. But then they end up creating this, like, spiritually enlightened, awesome super race, <laughs> which, which then turns around and... It, it wipes them out, right? Like it. Yeah, it's the brain. sort of yada yada yada. At that point, it's the first time in the book it starts doing that, which eventually it starts doing a lot when it skips over more time. Right. <laughs> um, which I, I like because it it keeps it from being repetitive. Because like, uh, yeah, it's obvious that the same things are happening over and over again, but it doesn't dwell on that. Yeah, yeah, but I do it like that. Keep, make you repeat uh, the story. It just says. Yeah, you know what happened. They they rebelled against their leaders and then right. supplanted them. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was yeah, it's, he's he's at that point he's starting to make the point of like, hey, it's almost like humanity keeps repeating its mistakes over <laughs> and over again. Although in this case, it's a good thing uh, because the fifth men are what he he sort of identifies the second men, the fifth men, one or two of the others as being like particularly promising for oh, they could have really uh, they could have really you know, trans transcended yeah. humanity. It's the fifth men who start peering into the past, right? They start yes. doing that. Yeah. And they yeah. have telepathy as well. Like the brains. Oh, them... uh, based on the, uh, marsh, uh, the, uh, the fourth men, the living brains put, uh, uh, biology from the Martians in them. So that's how the telepathy works. Right. And that's, uh, they have but... some Martian DNA, I guess. Right. And, and again, I like it. It's just purely through intellect. They kind of stumble across, they create this, you know, race of compassionate, emotional, philosophical, spiritual super geniuses, <laughs> and they didn't care. Well, they cared about it from an intellectually cur curious point of view, but they didn't uh, mean for it to become like, oh, well, wait a minute, that's what we were missing. You know, we we foil we played ourselves, as DJ Khaled would say. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, uh, yeah, and and they're sort of uh, they become the, uh, the 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 race that might transcend all this and become great. Uh, but then. What happens with the moon? Something with the moon happens. The moon's going to crash into the earth. <laughs> moon's haunted. Um, <laughs> th yeah, it's... And doesn't he specifically say that the moon is destroyed by, like, intelligence on earth? Like, when people get too smart, the moon Oh, I think gets... it implied that later. It didn't really dwell on it, though. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah he, he, he implies that... When people on Earth get too smart and possibly telepathic, it knocks the moon out of orbit. That's just a natural consequence of yeah, people, that, humans that, getting too smart. Yeah, that's mentioned much later. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> so, I'm uh, not quite sure of the logic there, but he does he does suggest that that's a thing. Um, that like that the moon intelligence has a has a has an effect on the moon. Very strange, but. Um, but as a result, Earth becomes uninhabitable, right? Like it gets, uh, it gets yeah. shattered. Yeah. Well, they and... know this is going to happen, right? Because uh, their science tells. So they they prepare. Uh, they realize that uh, their only chance is to uh, terraform Venus. Basically, they don't use the word terraform, but it's an early example of that. Right. Introducing um, plant life and stuff and uh, to to Venus to make the atmosphere more uh, palatable, and also uh, creating a. Uh, um, a race of themselves who can, uh, or a version of humanity that can survive on Venus. Right. Which would be the sixth man, of course. Yeah. And those are, they're like seal people, right? No, no. Uh, that's an offshoot race. Oh. Um, they, uh, cause evolution sort of diverges a couple times after this point. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. There's, uh, the six men are smaller, uh, but they're sort of, um, they're designed for, um, uh, life on Venus uh, and uh, some of them eventually uh, evolve into seal men <laughs> by going back into the water. And um, but they they the seal men get wiped out by the land dwellers. Right. Um, then the um, but the uh, the six men are obsessed with the idea of flying, so they develop the seventh man, 
as winged right. creatures. Right. Did they genetically engineer the seventh man? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. There's yeah. another couple of rises and falls of civilization, and they eventually achieve a, a world government, and uh, that that happens a lot, <laughs> like we've mentioned. Yeah. Um, yeah, that seems to be the thing that Stapledon thought would be the at least the first step of you know <laughs> mankind evolving to a certain point. Yeah. Uh, so they they come together to you know we really want to fly, so we're gonna just make a version of us that can fly. Right. It's like creating their own first sonas or something. Uh, <laughs> and they do. Well, that yep. is pretty cool. I'd, I'd take it. I wouldn't say no. <laughs> uh, but then the point of the seventh men, if I recall correctly, is that they're kind of, because they fly, it's like they don't have, they don't want to do anything. They don't strive for anything else because, well, hey, we can they fly. Sort of do. It was so they, cool. Yeah. Uh, they have to live on land for, for certain amounts of time. Uh, because they have to farm and you know do all that stuff to to keep the species alive, but they hate it. Like they're they're made for flying, and uh, flying brings them joy and mm-hmm. and a certain level of not quite detachment, but a sort of connection with uh, with uh, what happens. So they they accept tragedy and just embrace it as beautiful. Um, right. But when they're on the ground, they just they hate everything. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it's kind and, of, um, yeah, it's like a metaphor sorry. for kind of like there, you know, you get too much sort of joy and transcendence and you lose touch with reality, basically, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, they uh, eventually evolve into a flightless version of them that supplants them. Yeah. And um, uh, then they kind of, is that's this is where they start to sort of fast forward through. Yeah, the the eighth men, the next uh, are described as long headed. I can't remember much about them, but uh, Venus is going to become an uninhabitable well, because the uh, sun is expanded. Right, which and, it would because uh, we're like at least a billion years in the future at this point. So yeah, the sun is uh, and to they turn into they right realize now. that the only chance is to go to Neptune, but <laughs> Neptune's um, not fit for for present human life, so they have to engineer and quickly or relatively quickly a version of humanity that can survive on Neptune. And mm. uh, they create the ninth men who are dwarfs, but uh, it doesn't really go right because they quickly devolve into animals. Mm. And the entire uh, planet Neptune is swarmed with descendants of humans, but they, they evolve into like a vast uh, uh, ecosystem of different animals. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that that's interesting because um, a lot of, a lot of science fiction writers see evolution as like a straight line, like a ladder you climb. Right. But it's just a matter of fitting into a, fitting into your environment. So it's not like a, um, uh, yeah, this is a, it's just, not necessarily a realistic look at evolution, but it's a no. more, more true to life version of evolution where it yeah. just sort of um, sometimes accidents happen and then you have to adjust yeah. to that. And, right. Well, there, there's a book um, called uh, Man After Man, I think it's called. Uh, have you seen this? Uh, occasionally pictures I think of it so. show up on social uh, media. Yeah, it's, Speculative evolution thing? Right, yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, where would man go in hundreds of years, yeah, uh, think... millions of years? And it, yeah, it, some of them literally devolve. It, like mankind splits into all these different subspecies that are that don't seem like they're similar at all. And there's genetic engineering. And I, I kind of suspect that book was in, influenced by... Olaf Stapledon, uh, because of all the stuff that happens. But yeah, mm-hmm. but I, I I think that's an art book. That's mostly about, uh, if I recall correctly, the artist painted all these different. Yeah, I've seen some images from it. He also, I think the the artist uh, he or she did a um, one on um, uh, for past uh, like um, different versions of uh, how we viewed the past. Okay, uh, like animal like extinct species, like um, there, there's this one that goes around of like um, uh, how uh, archaeologists in the future would put together a cat and um, from Uh-oh. the bones, like how they would envision how the, how the cat looked and it's it just completely wrong because it like, oh, okay. it's like the skin is like next to the bone. Like we do with like we, how we draw dinosaurs. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I yeah, that that's uh that's kind of fun to do that. Hey dudes, time for the mammoth hunt. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, anyway I just... so um eventually um 
uh, intelligence arises again out of a rabbit-like species, uh, the uh, uh, Tenth Men. And then it skips over a number of rises and falls. Uh, so it goes from the Tenth to the Fourteenth Men. Um, and uh, it's sort of the 14th to 17th men are sort of like versions of the first, second, and fifth men. So it's sort of life is repeating itself on Neptune a bit. And um, the 17th men eventually genetically engineer the 18th men, who are the narrators of the book we're reading. Right. And uh, the, the 18th men are the last men, and um, they're sort of um, perfected in a way. Yeah. Again, it's have, it's like they almost got there to the you know transcendently perfect humanity, uh, but then they discover that the solar system is going to fall into a a pocket of gas. I think it was. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, well, we'll get to that in a second. But the uh, the eighteenth men have uh, a sort of cosmic consciousness. They they think about this, um, astronomy and things. They have a eye on top of their head that can sort of see better than modern telescopes, you know. Um, and they um, they link together telepathically, um, and they, they form uh, um, sex groups because uh, they have uh, multiple genders, um, which is similar to uh, the uh, Saturnians from Saturn and Ferrandil. Always going to bring that book up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's several sexes, like several, like, uh, uh, recognize biological sexes um and uh they form sort of group bonds they also have uh ritual cannibalism which is kind of weird um it, it describes them as like t very large and furry and they have extra eyes on all sides of their heads and on the top and um it said they, they would look extremely grotesque to modern humans but there'd be something recognizable human about, recognizably human about them and uh, but yeah, they discover that that uh, they're they're doomed basically uh, due to a cosmic yeah. event, and uh, yeah. and that's the reason they're reaching back in time to sort of to tell us. Although I don't know if they they literally say, "Oh, let's change history." They no, don't really... they 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 say they can't. Um, they uh, they realize that there are certain points in history that are affected by people either them reaching out into the past or possibly some other consciousness reaching into the past. So they, they just rec it's like a stable time loop sort of thing. Right. Um, and they're trying, their, their goal with the, um, uh, reaching into the past is to get some of, uh, modern humanity's, uh, sort of drive to survive because they've sort of, they've lost that in their community, uh, living. Um, they right. want to get some of the sort of individualistic, you know, we want to, thrive and stuff because they have to complete their their task of um uh sending out um uh microscopic uh uh org organisms into space and spreading them across so that they'll eventually possibly land on a planet and develop into humanity again right yeah they're trying to they're trying to find a way to keep to panspermia as it's called uh send yeah. out uh biology biology out into space so they might not technically be the last men there's a there's a chance there's sort of a glimmering of hope that they'll they'll be able to to keep uh to keep uh their their species or at least their genetic matter alive and it'll evolve mm -hmm. into something else um but yeah it's it's uh you know they know they're doomed essentially which is again a big theme in this it's sort of how do you face you know the inevitable but uh but they're they're enlightened enough that they're sort of facing it with um uh, at least at first, uh, a certain degree of um, seeing the beauty in it. Right. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, once uh, the sun starts, you know, all the, all, you know, the the everything's heating up and they're they're going crazy. They lose their telepathic links, and there's only a few sort of sane people left uh, by the end, by the last communication. Yeah, the final chapter is literally like they, because they're effectively immortal, but you know, when they realized they were sort of doomed they stopped having kids so there was literally one last one who had been born uh who's the literally the last man ever and he's sort of the wisest of them all and you know again it's sort of like we were almost 
you know, he, he's, he's sort of the epitome of what mankind could have been. And he's, uh, he gives these sort of words of comfort to everyone, which is the, the final words of the book, which I read at the beginning because the last and first men. So, um, yeah. It's, um, it, yeah. So, um, you, you mentioned that this has sort of been forgotten somewhat, but there was a movie adaptation. Yeah. Somehow. Um, it's, uh, which is weird to think about it. Cause it seems like if there's, if anything is an unadaptable book, it's this, but, um, it's an interesting movie. Um, it's, um, it was made in 2017, uh, directed the first and last, uh, uh, movie by, uh, Johan Johansson, who was a, uh, Icelandic composer. He did the score for the movie Arrival and other things. Um, and he did the score for this as well, but he also directed it. And it's uh, black and white photography with narration by Tilda Swinton from excerpts from the book. Mostly covers the Neptunian. Uh, yeah, it's the just last... the last bit. Yeah. Yeah, and it's only an hour and ten minutes, but it, it's it's interesting. I'd read the book instead because yeah. there's more there, but um, it's, it's an interesting it's... companion piece. In some ways, it does boil down. Like, if you're interested in it from a thematic perspective, it kind of, this does give you the very quick potted version of the themes. It just doesn't have all the cool sci-fi world building of the book, basically. Yeah. Um, it, and it's literally just shots of, of uh, like, old Soviet architecture, brutalist European architecture, and Tilda Swinton narrating stuff. So there's no real yeah. There's no real story. <laughs> uh, well, there, I mean, there's a story, but it's it's just sort of, Hey, we're telepathically talking to you from the future, and it's all quotes from the books. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. and it's uh, it's mostly black and white with some uh, mm -hmm. weird color stuff. It's hard <laughs> to describe. You occasionally get it like a green blip that's trying to reach yeah. you from the future. Um, I found it. Yeah, it's it's um, it's a uh, it's an interesting book. Like I say, that really, I actually I heard about this because of an interview with Alan Moore, uh, who had mentioned that. Oh yeah, there's these books that you know are falling out of print that aren't as well known anymore that I kind of cherish because you know they're the endangered species of books. And uh, he mentioned Olaf Stapledon as the one that had all these cool ideas. And uh, so I checked it out, and yeah, it's 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 uh, it's pretty neat. It's Apparently, definitely back in print though, so it's it's readily available now. Yeah, it's it's it, yeah. Again, there you go. I mean, it it, <laughs> it is. It seems pretty seminal. Like I, I can see, and he was well known at the time. He was he was pretty popular. This book was pretty did pretty well. Uh, he was corresponded with uh, Virginia Woolf, H. G. Wells. And uh, C.S. Lewis's Cosmic Trilogy was apparently written partly in response uh, to Last and First Men and uh, Star Maker, uh, because C.S. Lewis was kind of... Apparently C.S. Lewis admired him, but really thought his, uh, his morality was weird, or at least the book's morality was weird. Um, because yeah, it, he seemed to... Yeah, I, I mean, that's know. understandable. That's C.S. Lewis for you. <laughs> yeah. Because um, um, it is literally like, well, we transcend and God doesn't factor into it, and it's all about mankind becoming completely different. And you know, he was probably a little more fixated on the idea of the human soul being eternal and not changing that much ultimately. And that yeah, we have. I've only read of... the first of the Cosmic Trilogy, but uh, yeah. this is better. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. No. I there's stuff about the Cosmic Trilogy I do like, and of course, it's much more human. It's got more personality and more character to it, as it were. This is more intellectual and. And Lewis, you know, I, I there's stuff I like about Lewis. I know he's he can be a he's kind of a jerk about a lot of stuff, both in his writing and, <laughs> um, and in, I uh, in reality, I used but, to like uh, Narnia when I was a kid, but I don't yeah, know, of course, I, Lewis isn't for me. <laughs> well, yeah, he's very reactionary in in many ways and stuff like that. But you can see him responding, um, like some of the stuff in the Cosmic Trilogy, like he talks about a race of moon men who are pure intellect. Although again, that's framed as bad in this book, so it's not really a response <laughs> in that sense. Um, but you know, there is, there is stuff in the cosmic trilogy about sort of, uh, you know, uh, mankind can evolve into something higher, but it's always evil and it's always inspired by Satan kind of thing. And cause mm -hmm. it's, that's a temporal evolution. It's gotta be a spiritual evolution, but again, they yeah. weren't as, they weren't as far apart. I feel like they weren't actually that far apart. You can, you can frame them that way, but they weren't, you know, intellectually they, they, one was religious and one wasn't, but they weren't that much in disagreement in many ways but anyway i don't know mm. it's uh, uh there there have been a couple other um, movie adaptations or at least attempts there was one movie uh from a book i from a story you did that i that i haven't read i, I oh. didn't even write it down it's got brian cox in it apparently 
And really? uh, they were going to make a, um, a uh, movie of Odd John in uh, 1966 starring David McCallum. Right. That would be weird. Yeah. It was an adult, and John didn't live past uh, past his early 20s, and he looked quite younger. So I don't know mm. how that would have worked. Well, they would have. Yeah, they are always changing stuff in, in that time period. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, oh, uh, another thing about, just back to Odd John for a second. Uh, uh, although it does go into, like, um, uh, spiritualistic stuff. Well, like psychic. They develop psychic powers, and they can... They eventually learn how to split the atom with their mind and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, it, it has some sort of scientific ideas that uh, things like X-Men sort of skip over. Like it's not like they're, the mutation that causes Homo Superior is uh, described as coming from a single mutation in the past. And it's just sort of been repressed and, event and is now sort of um, coming out. So like it, they have a common ancestor sort of thing. Uh, right. Which I found interesting. Yeah. The X Men yeah. mutants thing doesn't really make sense from a scientific perspective. But, well, uh, <laughs> other than well, obviously, but yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, but but yeah, that was clearly uh, it, there. Are, as we've said when, when we did Gladiator, uh, our uh, was I think our fifth show, which we talked about how it had obviously had a big impact on uh, Superman and superheroes, and you can find these stories where you're like, oh yeah, that was obviously something they'd read before, you know, Stan Lee. Did something and this is one of these it's it's clearly an influence on uh you know marvel there's also a book so. called uh from the 50s i believe called children of the atom so yeah yeah x-men had a lot of uh yeah, yeah. forerunners the, well that was yeah i mean people were hanging on the idea of well we'll evolve into something more powerful that was actually becoming a big thing i mean quite a bit before uh, x-men and as we can see in this story uh this is yeah 1930s. but uh it, it's interesting how a lot of the iconography like uh Phrases like "Children of the Atom" and yeah, "Homo yeah. Superior" and stuff were directly taken from earlier books. Right. Yeah. Yep. Well, again, they they tended to, Marvel Comics. They tend to put that out there, thinking, "Oh, you know, no one will read these again for another." <laughs> you know, they'll read it in in two weeks. They'll throw it in the garbage, and nobody will, nobody will remember it until <laughs> people started remembering it. So some of it's built that way. Well, we've come to the end of human history. On behalf of Adam Prosser, the gigantic house-sized brain, and Philip Rice, the Neptunian super rabbit, we bid you farewell. Thanks, as always, to Alex Ross, the nth-level telepathic intelligence, and Jack Furick, founder of the Empire of Music, for the theme song. If you enjoy the show, you might want to join the truly evolved specimens of humanity who donate to our Patreons. It helps us afford the hosting and recording costs, and patrons are able to listen to the show early and get a bunch of other stuff like comics and illustrations. Just look under Philip Rice or Adam Prosser at patreon.com, or go to neversleepsnetwork slash series slash what-mad-universe for the links. You can also get this podcast via iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or your podcaster of choice, as well as on YouTube via Phil's channel. And if you enjoy it, please leave a review. It would help us quite a lot, and it would also help us if you'd spread the word about What Mad Universe. Tell your friends or link to us on social media. Phillip's on Twitter as SpearHalfOck with an F underscore. And I'm Prankster36. The show itself is WMU Podcast. We'll see you in another two billion years, or two weeks, whichever comes first. <laughs>